Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the forum discussion of Springfield Business Journal's 2020 Economic Growth Survey. I'm Jennifer Jackson, publisher of Springfield Business Journal. In 2019, Springfield Business Journal partnered with Titus Williams and Prosperity Partners to produce a data set that would help identify needs in the Springfield community and chart a path for economic growth. Of course, it was our interest to collect data that wasn't being collected elsewhere and that would help guide those most engaged in economic development for our community to do their jobs. So quickly, we gathered a steering committee that consisted of representatives from city government, the local utility, the Area Chamber of Commerce, Department of Workforce Development, Higher Education, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, and members of the nonprofit and business communities. As you can imagine, this led to some very valuable discussions in forums much like these, and the development of a business confidence index by which we could compare ourselves over time. This was the beginning of what would be a five-year project. And as valuable as those discussions were in the first year, and as we began 2020, there's no way that we could have anticipated the importance of the timing of this research and what it would mean to us as we began the recovery efforts from COVID. Just a short two weeks after the completion of data collection for 2020, our world's turned upside down. And so this put us in a very unique position to measure the changes that took place. Um, so quickly, uh, we went out with a second survey to measure these changes. And I believe put our community in an unparalleled position of strength to really see what's coming at us and to address those needs. Um, there will be six forums over the remainder of the year so that we can keep this conversation going. And we are doing that with the support of sponsors like our overarching sponsor, Prosperity Partners, who has signed on to do this for all five years and who is leading the efforts uh, in gathering information. And with four additional sponsors that include H Design Group, Bryan Properties, Alice Acres Arney, and Toth and Associates. All our Acres Arney will actually provide additional information for this forum, and each of our four supporting sponsors will provide expertise and additional viewpoints for the print coverage of these events, as well as the discussions that take place within them. Today's forum will be very interactive. And there are several ways that you can participate. So this isn't a webinar uh, just designed to be viewed. We actually want you to participate in the conversation because that's in fact how we'll move forward. Uh, the first way that you can participate is by logging in now on another device to pollev.com slash Jennifer Jack. 977. Again, that's P O L L E V dot com slash J E N N I F E R J A C K 977. You will see poll questions come up on the screen during this morning's broadcast. And if you'll respond to those, you'll actually see that live data collection and the analysis of that on screen. An additional way that you can participate is by using the chat function. Um, in this way, you'll be able to interact with other participants, you'll be able to ask questions, and you'll be able to make comments. And finally, in the final portion of today's broadcast, we'll have a town hall meeting. Um, this will be much different than it was last year when we all participated in person. But we have the means to promote you as panelists. If you go to the, um, let's see, I guess it is the participant tab at the bottom of your screen. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, you can find the participant tab. And there you can click the hand icon to raise your hand and you'll actually be called upon by a technician here in our offices this morning that will promote you to as a panelist and you'll be seen and visible to others that are watching this morning's broadcast as you make your comments. Um, with that, 
I'm going to turn things over to H2R Market Research, who is our research partner for this entire project. And um, they did the in-depth data collection and analysis that was part of these surveys. They will kick us off this morning with a presentation of the Business Confidence Index. That's the index I mentioned earlier that we're comparing to 2019 and early collections of 2020, and then discussing the differences that we see in the second survey of 2020. Joining us is Ashley Garut, uh, who worked in partnership um, there at H2R Market Research. Please welcome Ashley Garut. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Garut, and I'm going to be taking you through the Business Confidence Index today that H2R um, did all of the data collection for for the past two years. So first, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So um, first, I just want to say thank you for having me today. Um, I'm excited to speak to you about the Business Confidence Index for Springfield this year. Um, we've got some really great data because we started measuring last year, like Jennifer said. So seeing this data over time is going to be really inter interesting. So first, I'm just going to take a moment to introduce you to the index and tell you a bit about why we measure it. So indexing provides us with a simple approach to compare several key business confidence metrics. We boil these down to one number, which is the business confidence index, and we can track that number over time, and it tells us a lot of information in one place. Uh, it gives us the barometer for the perceived health of the Springfield market, um, and that's among our business leaders. Uh, so there is some predictive value in measuring the degree to which those business leaders plan to add or take away jobs, invest in capital, and borrow and spend money. And those are the main KPIs that we use to measure that index. So a quick overview of the math behind the index. Uh, we take three key areas, the outlook on business the employment plans of business leaders, and the confidence in the local economy. Each of these factors is weighted, so business sector outlook is weighted for 25%. Uh, the uh, employment plans are weighted at 35%, and outlook on the local economy at 40% of the index. And we calculate this the same way every time we measure it, so that we're comparing apples to apples year over year, or in this case, multiple times in a year. So right now we've measured the Business Confidence Index for Springfield three times. The first time was last year in 2019. Uh, we did it again in February of this year. And because just a couple of weeks later, uh, the pandemic hit and really changed uh, outlook on business and employment plans and economy, we decided to go ahead and measure that again in April of this year. So first, I want to take a look at the different components that make up the Business Confidence Index to tell you a little bit about how we got there. So the first section, like I mentioned, is business sector outlook, and this is how business leaders feel their business sector will do over the next year. So. As you can see, prior to the pandemic, business leaders still expected improvement from their business sectors. Um, in 2019, we saw 61% saw improvement over the next year. Uh, and then in early this year, we were still at 58%, hardly any, any uh, worsening. And so our, our net score was 52% early this year. But just a few short weeks later, that really shifted, and those expecting their businesses to worsen increased nearly fourfold. Uh, and those expecting improvement declined by nearly 20 points. This caused our net expectations for businesses over the next year to drop pretty dramatically. We're still at a positive 16%, so not all bad news, um, but we did drop pretty significantly after COVID hit. Uh, looking at those expectations by sector, we see that the B2B sector had some of the strongest outlook pre-COVID. However, the sector also saw one of the largest drops post-COVID, and that was by 47 points. 
It was followed closely by a 46 point drop in expectations among the goods sector. Uh, currently, the sector with the strongest outlook is the combination of goods and services sector, um, and they're looking at about a net 24% improvement in the next year. Not quite as good as what they were looking at prior to COVID, um, but that's one of our stronger sectors right now. So the next part of the equation is employment plans for the next year. Prior to the pandemic, this was in February of this year that this metric was measured, half of business leaders in Springfield expected to increase their employment numbers in the next year. Uh, this was really great news for us going into uh, 2020. We saw that not only were they planning to recruit and replace anybody that left, but we saw a really strong indicator that there was going to be lots of hiring going on in the next year and virtually no businesses expected to reduce their number of employees. Um, however, that's been since put on pause. Nearly half of businesses plan to make no changes at this point to their workforce or hiring practices. The good news is one in five businesses still hope to hire new employees who may become available as a result of the pandemic. So we're still seeing some optimism there, which is good. Then the final part of the business confidence index equation is the outlook on the local economy. So pre-COVID, the economy was just a bit more reserved compared to 2019. Uh, we still saw quite a bit of positive outlook, a little more negative outlook than we saw last year, but that was nothing compared to the sharp decline we saw when we went back out into the field in early April. Um, but Missouri has officially opened for business uh, as of last week. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if we see some more positive shifts in the outlook on the local economy um, as we continue to go into this new reopening phase and hopefully continue on a good path with that. Um, I, we did go ahead and take a look at that confidence in the local economy across each one of the business sectors that we surveyed in the research. Um, and we can see that it's pretty universal across sectors that um, their outlook dropped quite a bit. So taking all three of those together and weighting each sector accordingly, we see that due to the declines in expected business performance, confidence in the local economy, and their plans for hiring, uh, the post-pandemic business confidence did see a pretty significant decline, and that was true across all business sectors. But it is something that we expected. So we wanted to take a look at and dig just a little bit deeper into what, uh, oh, let me go back real quick. We wanted to take a look at that and see if there were any interesting shifts by age or business position or um, or even gender to see if we could find a little bit more information about how people felt about their business confidence. Um, we saw that younger business leaders tended to be a bit more optimistic than their older counterparts. Uh, those 18 to 34 years old were just as likely to hire new employees post-COVID as those who were 35 to 54 or 55 plus, but on the other hand, they're much less likely to get rid of employees um, that are lower performing that we measured post-COVID. So their net hiring plans were just a bit higher and that pushed that business confidence index higher for them um, as part of that equation. They also, those 18 to 34, have a much more positive outlook um, on their business in the coming year than 35 to 54 year olds, um, but not quite as positive as those over 55. So that was really interesting to us that um, business outlook is the highest among those over the age of 55. And younger business leaders have more confidence in the local economy. While it's very small, um, there is a 7% of those 18 to 34 year olds expecting an increase in the economy in the next year versus just an average of 4% increase among those older than 34. So the combination of those small, uh, more positive outlooks uh, cost the 18 to 34 year old business confidence index to come in just a bit higher than the others. 
Um, so taking a look at gender, male business leaders are still slightly more optimistic. Their business confidence index dropped by 65 points between February and April. Female business leaders, their business confidence only dropped by 57 points. Um, so just a little bit smaller gap there. And finally, um, higher level business leaders in the VP position or higher saw a pretty significant 49 point drop in their confidence index between February and April. They actually started out a bit higher than people who were in that um, employee supervisor manager position. Um, but once they dropped, they dropped slightly lower because they had a, a, a bigger drop uh, than, than those others. So just some key takeaways that we saw uh, throughout our research that we wanted to hit on that impact the business confidence index. Um, the economic growth research, first of all, we've, we've mentioned this before, is typically conducted in late February. So the initial 2020 results were almost immediately nullified by the shutdowns that began in mid-March. Uh, the latest round of research was conducted just a few weeks after the initial shutdown to get an initial take on how the Springfield area business leaders were feeling at that time. Uh, we weren't surprised to see the dramatic decreases in the confidence, um, and, and that was due to how well people thought they were going to perform at the time. So um, we're, we're really interested to see how things progress after this initial shock wears off. Um, and hopefully go back out in the field and, and test this again to see how well we're going to start recovering as things start to open up and hopefully the pandemic starts to subside. Um, just a, a reality check, though, that being in the Midwest, we are more sheltered from the pandemic um, and its economic effects than other places in the country. Um, we're a little bit more conservative in the Midwest. Um, with our with our money with our time and so we've seen fewer cases and our businesses as a result of that are more prepared to weather the storm. For example, we saw in our research that area businesses said they had enough cash on hand back in April to last another 12 weeks if those current conditions stayed um, and that was compared to just 27 days for the average business nationwide. And so seeing that, we know we're, we're actually well beyond that now. We're in mid to late June. Um, we're, we're, we're almost out of that time and things are starting to open back up. So we're excited to see if things start to progress more positively um, and see if we think that we can last even longer at this point. Uh, since then, the entire state has seen phased reopenings all the way to a fully open for business order from the governor enacted just last week. Um, I expect that if we were to ask these same questions today, confidence in business sectors and economy and hiring plans would look much more positive than what we see um, in this research today. Um, we saw that many of the business leaders in our community were able to take advantage of the CARES Act PPP loan um, and enable them to continue paying their employees. About half of the businesses indicated that they would not change their hiring practices at this time. So it makes us feel good about job security in our area. Um, we did see that, you know, instead of adding more jobs, that the number of people planning to add dropped to just 20% instead of 50%. So we're just a little bit more reserved than we were. But having said that, no matter what happens with hiring practices, we do believe the way we work is definitely going to change. We saw in our survey that businesses are planning to allow much more work from home, uh, allow less business travel. Um, online video conferencing is going to, to make a surge. Obviously, we're, we're, we're shifting these forums online. Um, and these are just a few of the ways that businesses in our research indicated they would change their everyday operations. And this may change the way we hire, create new forms of workforce and talent acquisition challenges. And we must begin those conversations now that will help our community thrive in that new normal. Finally, if there's anything we can learn from past disasters, it's that the timing of the economic downfall can usually tell us something about the recovery. In the past, usually, when the economy downturns very quickly, the bounce back is also just as fast. So um, I think our expectations need to be tempered a little bit because 
the recovery may happen quickly, but it's going to look very different on the other side. Um, we don't think that the recovery will put us back to the way things were before. We think that the recovery will put us into a new normal um, and just something to be thinking about how Springfield can thrive in that new normal. Uh, and that is all I have today to kick off the Business Confidence Index. Uh, thank you very much. And if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to take those. think about and discuss for the rest of this morning. And I'm Eric Olson, Editorial Director for Springfield Business Journal. Uh, we're going to transition into a, a panel discussion uh, on the economy um, with, with the basis of this BCI, the local, this, it's the first local BCI that, that uh, we have produced, but the second year now. So we have that um, comparison figures and um, I'm, I'm really glad to have uh, some economic minds join us for a discussion that um, that will take place right now. Um, we've invited three people with uh, economic minds <coughs> to discuss where we go from here, and I, I would like to uh, introduce them briefly before we get started. Um, first is uh, Matt Morrow, President and CEO of the Springfield Area Chamber of Commerce. Matt, thank you for joining us this morning. How are you? Thanks, Eric. Good. How are you doing? We also have KC Matthews, the Chief Investment Officer from UMB Bank. Thank you for joining us, KC. In Good morning. City. Pleasure. Good to be with you. And Steve Mullins, Economics Professor at Drury University. Steve, glad you could be here with us this morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm fine. Thank you. So panelists, let's start with this local business confidence index. It's currently at 81.7, as we saw, down from 142.8 near the start of the year. That's a serious swing, mostly expected with uh, the, the given situation um, in our global pandemic. The baseline being 100, how do we start to get back to a healthy confidence level? Um, I, I see this as like taking a, a temperature, maybe appropriately here, using a, a medical analogy. And um, <coughs> like many, I'd, I'd like to get some doctor's orders. So I'm looking to you guys as, as the uh, physicians of this economy here. And um, I want to get a prescription. So what are, those, what are those factors that we can be on the lookout for uh, in order to uh, correct uh, this, this economy and get back on, on track? Maybe we start from a macro level. KC, would you care to, to handle that? Yeah, and it's hard, a little hard to hear you, Eric, but I think you asked for a macro level report. So the local confidence, hopefully you can hear me okay. Eric? Uh, I can hear you fine, KC. Right. Okay. I think I'm just going to continue. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. But the, the local confidence numbers have really followed the national confidence numbers where consumer confidence has gone down significantly. And the reason is, of course, economic conditions shut down, zero economic activity, so to speak. And I believe that consumer confidence to get to your prescription is driven by the labor market and asset prices amongst a few other things. But when we're gainfully employed, we feel good about things and we consume. And when asset prices, whether it's the stock market or home prices, et cetera, go up, we have a thing called the wealth effect. We feel good and we consume. So to get back to a state of normalcy, I believe one, the labor market 
has to stabilize. And I say stabilize because <clears throat> today you could get some confusion where most people, something like 80% of people that are unemployed are classified as temporarily unemployed. And we'll see as the economy opens up, what will happen to consumers' behaviors that will everyone get called back to work? And we're thinking that even by the end of the year, we're still gonna have something like 10% unemployment. So looking at uh, continuing claims, you still have 20 and a half million people that are unemployed, but they still feel good, I think, because they're classified as temporary. Their bosses are telling them, we're going to bring you back as soon as possible. So as long as that happens, we'll get back to that state of normalcy. But if it doesn't, and all of a sudden these temporarily classified people that are unemployed move to permanently well, then the question is, what will happen to economic activity? And I would say it somewhat stalls. The unemployment claims are, are vast. Um, we don't see that as, as much here in, in Missouri and Springfield in, in particular. Um, had a good report just recently. Steve, is there anything that, um, you know, what would you say uh, is a trickle down to uh, the, the items that Casey and the fact that Steve brought up. Uh, Eric, Eric, I can hardly hear you, but I think you addressed me, is that correct? Yeah, Steve, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on what Casey said. This is, uh, this is the first recession we've experienced in my lifetime that was completely driven by a collapse of consumer spending. And he's, and he's correct. Um, the consumer part of spending on GDP is not going to re recover until consumer confidence recovers. And the only uh, point of departure that I have with Casey is he said that he, or his argument was, or his position was that, that consumer confidence being so low is being driven by labor market conditions, which are clearly poor, and asset prices. But I'd add a third factor here, and that's the consumer's interpretation and understanding of the health, the health risks associated with both uh, working in an environment where you come into contact with other human beings and also engaging as a consumer in restaurants and bars and other, other venues where a lot of human to human contact is expected. We haven't seen anything like this in a hundred years and this and the health environment is having an impact on those consumer confidence numbers uh, in a way that has, has not in the past. Yeah. You, uh, you talk about the consumer and getting um, spending activity um, active again. And I want to take a, a look here at the, uh, the, the federal um, stimulus money that was distributed and uh, get a sense from you all if you think, how you, how you think that was spent and, and handled. Um, did, did giving the, the working population that money um, work? Was that an effective a way to, to stimulate the economy so far, or might we see the, the fruit of that in, in days ahead yet? What do you guys think? Um, I, I'll, I'll certainly be willing to go if no one steps in. Um, you know, it, it's hard to spend or try to spend $2.2 .2 trillion and do it in a way that it can't be criticized. Um, uh, because we simply had to throw a lot of a lot of income at a lot of different uh, economic entities quickly, but I think most economists would give the um, the CARES Act, you know, a, a B, a B plus. There's quite a bit of evidence to suggest that it hadn't been for those attempts to what uh, I wouldn't call it stimulus. I'd call it emergency relief to help households maintain their incomes. Um, that things would have been would have been a lot worse. I, I just found a study uh, done by one done by Harvard and another one done at Notre Dame that that, that have estimated the impact of the CARES Act, primarily the the federal extension of unemployment, the extra six hundred bucks a week. They've estimated that the uh, the poverty rate in the United States is barely going to budge and might might actually fall as opposed to rising by about thirty percent as a consequence of the additional income that's been provided to households as a part of the CARES Act. So I'd argue that's pretty effective at helping uh, the most disadvantaged among us uh, keep their financial orders or keep their financial situation intact. Eric, could I jump in on that? Yes, please, Casey. 
So I totally agree with Steve. Uh, the Fed, I think, has uh, acted appropriately. And the stock market, which is a leading indicator, uh, which would uh, echo that. Of course, the market recovered. There's an adage on Wall Street that goes something like, don't fight the Fed. And when the Fed uh, provides the liquidity, of course, the stock market does well and it leads to economic activity. But I would suggest that there may be unintended consequences. And that might be creating zombie companies and also the moral hazard. And that is, uh, there are many companies that were barely getting by before the epidemic, the pandemic, and, and today they're propped up due to stimulus. And the question is, should they be propped up? And once stimulus uh, 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 gets reduced to some degree, what will happen to those businesses? <coughs> You could make an argument that it might be good. You have that creative closing, meaning some businesses probably should close, and it, it paves the path to new companies, new ideas, and new creativity. But also there's a paper from the University of Chicago which says because of the additional unemployment insurance, you many people are receiving, 68% of beneficiaries are receiving uh, uh, more than what they earned and 28, 20% of those recipients are doubling their income uh, due to stimulus. So it creates a moral hazard as far as is there incentive to work. So there might be an, I think the Fed has acted appropriately. Stock market echoes that. The question is, will you have the next crisis down the road? Hmm. The, the next crisis, you, you bring to mind... Uh, of course, we have the medical pandemic, and now, uh, more recently, the so-called racial pandemic. Is is this a next crisis already? How uh, how has this, uh, with the the protests and demonstrations for Black Lives Matter, how is this playing into our our economic uncertainties? What's the outlook there, Matt? Maybe you want to speak to um, you know a recent demonstration this month in, in Springfield. Do you see that there's any effect on on the economy and the people's um, perceived safety in order to go out into the community and, and start consuming goods and services again. Uh, safety is one of these uh, critical issues here as we see on our screen for a return to economic health. If we're not feeling safe, we're not going to go out and spend and work. Um, Matt, do you think this the racial pandemic has a, a, a local impact? So I think for the most part, when people talk about safety, they're talking about about their you know, vulnerability to the, to the virus and, uh, and the potential that comes from a community spread type of, of event and activity. Probably, if you're talking about a situation where people are concerned about their safety for, um, you know, the impact of, uh, of, in some cases, violent demonstrations, I think that probably depends a lot on where, where people live and what they're experiencing and seeing. Here, you know, we've seen uh, a large gathering, but, but peaceful gathering. So I, you know, I don't think that's something that we have a lot of here. There may be a little bit of it from, uh, from some uh, edges. The bigger issue, I think, is when people are concerned about safety, they're, you know, they're still, you know, wondering whether it's safe for them to, to go to a restaurant, whether it's safe for them to do that and not be in, infected by a virus. One of the things that I might add, if I could, just to the, the broader conversation about the, uh, the federal stimulus, the, in particular, the, uh, the CARES Act funding for businesses, the Paycheck Protection Program loans that are forgivable if they're used for the right kinds of things. Those are, uh, those are lifelines, no question about it. Uh, I, I would say that under normal economic cycles, you have economic ups and downs and you have recessions and recoveries. And when you have a normal re recession and recovery, that does tend to kind of weed out those companies that were, that were just sort of riding a high wave. They maybe weren't doing things right. They maybe weren't, weren't all that healthy of a company, but they were, they were benefiting from just a, a rising tide. And so it you know, a normal recession does tend to thin some of that out a little bit, and that's not all bad. It's kind of like, uh, uh, almost like the natural process of thinning out uh, trees in a forest. But uh, I will also say that this this particular economic recession is so fundamentally different than anything that we've ever had. It's not a natural cycle. It's a completely unnatural cycle. It's one that we imposed on ourselves as a as a as a decision to protect public health, and so it, it really fundamentally interrupted. The basic bet that every, especially small business, but really every business makes, and that basic bet is I invest today on the bet that there will be customers tomorrow. 
and and we just did something we've really never done before at, at a nationwide level or to the extent that we've done it which is to take tomorrow away and once we do that that's a fundamentally different kind of an economic downturn than any kind of normal cyclical recession. And so in this sense, I think since essentially the, the government stopped business, took away the fundamental bet that businesses make, um, the, the steps that, that were put in place for the most part, I think are just helping good businesses uh, bridge to when they can start making the normal bet again. Uh, you are connected with small businesses here on, on the ground in Springfield in talks with them uh, regularly. Um, can, can you kind of give us a, a view of what this recession, the difference, the uniqueness of this recession on the ground here locally? Small businesses are impacted greatly. Um, in some ways it's like they're having to go back to a startup phase because they were shut down for so long and now kind of restart that engine and we all know what the outlook is for a, a startup company for entrepreneurs that in first year, two years, very difficult to survive. But I wonder even by industry, what are you, what are you hearing in, in terms of how this recession is uniquely affecting um, industries? We, tourism is the obvious one that's been um, nearly leveled and but hit bedrock and, and now actually coming back a little bit. But there are others, healthcare, education, uh, manufacturing has been stable, but what's what's the uh, perspective from from those folks on the ground? Um, well, just just uh, there are a couple really good questions in there, Eric. Let me back up to the kind of the beginning of that of that, and then I'll circle back to those uh, those sectors of the economy locally. But um, you know, our conversations, hundreds hundreds of them a week, and, and especially in the early stages, and and now a little bit less uh, intense, but still many uh, a day taking place with local businesses and they very much are reflective of what your data is showing. I mean that I think it's a very accurate reflection of where they are, where the confidence is, what has happened. Uh, I think you're absolutely right also to characterize this as kind of almost a, a return to startup which is a little scary because startups have a high fail rate but we also have to remember that the people who are returning to startup, the businesses that are returning to that startup mode are the ones who who didn't fail the first time. So that it's a it's a pool it's a little stronger than your average startup pool, if that makes sense. Uh, they're, they're better at this. They, they make good decisions. They, they, they have that, that uh, advantage. And I will also say that, you know, innovation is in the DNA of entrepreneurs, and, and you've seen a lot of that take place. So businesses that weren't set up to operate in the way that they're operating right now have, uh, many of them have innovative, they've gotten creative. Some of them are doing pretty well. Um, many of them are still struggling, but they're figuring out a way to get through and survive until things pick back up again. And so it's been pretty inspiring, actually, to see the way they, they respond to that. And, and in answer to your other question, many of them are, are focused on this because, you know, our economy has traditionally been pretty resilient and resistant to uh, sharp ups and downs uh, economically. And a big part of the reason for that is that our largest employment sectors are education and healthcare, uh, which tend to be a little recession resistant. Uh, they, in some ways, they almost are like a, a balance to recessionary uh, pressures because people go back to school and people continue to have health issues no matter what the economic conditions. And so uh, typically that has kind of kept us from hitting some of those deep lows that some of the national economies sometimes has hit. In this case, uh, we have to consider the reality that the direct impact on those two sectors of the economy, on education and healthcare, has been so significant and so severe that our recovery may look a little different than it has under, under traditional uh, uh, economic models here in Springfield. We may, we may need to be led out of this recovery more by, by sectors like manufacturing and construction and, and other sectors that are, that are strong in this area, but that have not traditionally been either our insulation or our lead out of, of uh, economic recession. There's just been significant impact to healthcare and significant impact to education educational institution when it comes to the appropriations they depend on and, and everything else. And it's been very, very rapid, very quick. It's not been a gradual decline. It's been, you know, overnight. It's a good, could I add something to that? Yeah, please? yeah, sure. Casey. Uh, in regard to small business, one of, one of the issues in forecasting what may happen to small business is the lack of data on delinquencies and defaults. So it's interesting, when we study most uh, bank loan books, you'll find 10 to 20% of the loan books have been modified or deferred the uh, payments. 
So all of a sudden, back to the comment about it's not a typical recession because you'd see that data, you'd get information on what's working, what's not working. Mm -hmm. Today, mortgages, for example, mortgage delinquencies are lower than what we've seen a year ago, perhaps because of the stimulus or the PPP. So the question is what will happen in the fall when all of a sudden small businesses and consumers have to start paying their mortgages again or their bank debt and how many will be able to do that and how many will not be able to do that. So right now it clouds the forecasting with small businesses and the consumer to some degree. Both of your, thanks Casey, both of your comments lead into our, our last question uh, for this discussion and that's your outlook for a recession. Um, obviously it takes some time to know you're in a recession, it's called a depression right now, but I've seen some national analysts say that this could be a, a 10 year period because of the uniqueness, the severity of it, the rapidness. What's, Casey, maybe we'll, uh, let you go from a, a, a national macro view and then um, if Steve is still with us and, and Matt, if you wanna address maybe how that affects Springfield, but 10 years, is that realistic? I don't believe so. I believe we'll get through this like we've gotten through other uh, recessions and uh, pandemics and epidemics. Um, it's interesting that you, some people have compared this to 1918, the Spanish flu. It was a two year slowdown in the economy. It was terrible loss of life. 675,000 people lost their life, but we made it through that without a vaccine. And we do have a vaccine or at least uh, advances on vaccines that looks like we're gonna get one. So I think this is gonna be a short lived recession uh, the shortest recession we've seen was back in the early 80s, six months. I think it'll be something like that, maybe even shorter. And then I believe the, re uh, the recovery will start and we'll go on to the next expansion. So I think it'll be a short-lived recession. And I think we're starting to see the effects of a recovery already. Short-lived, what is that, one year? The recession, I think, will be less than six months. Okay. Yeah, Steve, if I could, Yeah, if I could piggyback on that. Uh, According to the conference board, they've done some forecasting and their forecasting is as good as anybody else's at this point. They see a recovery, a pretty robust recovery starting in the third quarter after a 40% drop in GDP in the second quarter. Uh, but if you look at the footnotes of their forecast, they also have an alternative scenario that instead of looking like a, a check mark, uh, referencing Matt's comment about this recession being intentional, a recession by design, where we flip the economy off, and as soon as we feel that we can flip the economy back on, there's no reason that it can't recover quickly. There's, a, there's an alternative scenario. Instead of a, a V-shaped recovery, it's a W, and that's what happens if these spikes that we see in COVID in these states that opened up here in the last month, what if those spikes become more severe and we have to clamp down again and the economy goes back into recession? Uh, that's something that's unknown, but uh, uh, I'm not quite as optimistic as Casey is about the, the future of this economy. I think that it's unlikely that things are going to be return to normal until a, a vaccine is available because this particular um, virus seems to be a, a little bit more stealthy and a little bit more uh, uh, lethal than, uh, than the flu. And yeah, you, I hear you say you're concerned about those next waves. Um, exactly. Any, anything that, that you would add to that, Matt? I, I would tend to agree with both. The, uh, the, the markets are telling us that, that we're, uh, and as someone said earlier, I don't know if it was Steve or KC, but that's a leading indicator. The markets are telling us that they anticipate things to continue to move in that direction. And I always think it's fascinating to see how wise those markets are. Remember, there were a whole series of, of articles telling us that the market, there was something wrong with the stock market because here the market's going up and yet we've got all this joblessness. And then the, then the report that was anticipated to have a drop of seven and a half or eight million jobs was actually an increase of two and a half million. And so the markets had it right. They were, they were telling us before we had data what was going on uh, in the in the marketplace. And I think we see a little bit of that now too. I'm also concerned about a second uh, resurgence, but I will, I will also tell you, I do not anticipate, even if there's fairly significant infection that begins to happen in the fall, I do not anticipate the kind of shutdown that we did in the, in the spring. You have to remember why we did that. The reason that we did that, if people kind of forget this and start to kind of convince themselves that the reason we did that was to stop infection. That's not, that was never going to happen. Uh, what was, what was going to happen was to pause infection long enough uh, for us to build capacity to deal with what was anticipated to be a massive scale public health event. And, and so during that time to the credit of, uh, 
of a lot of the people in the healthcare industry and, and uh, public policy officials and everything else, we did. We built significant capacity at a national level, at a local level, and everything else. So, so uh, I, I would be shocked, honestly, if even if there is significant increase, if we go back to a, a lockdown kind of a, of a model. There may be steps that we have to take uh, that, that we don't anticipate now that, that are designed to help protect us, help slow the virus. Um, but I, it, would be, uh, it would be surprising to me, and in my view, a huge mistake to lock down the economy a second time. Excellent, excellent commentaries. Thank you each for, for uh, participating. Uh, I know these are busy, unique times for, for you guys as well. And uh, uh, this here we are on, on Zoom is a, a perfect example of, of the uniqueness of it. And so um, giving us and our audience a, a lot to, to think about and um, help us to navigate these uncharted waters as, uh, as business owners and leaders. And so uh, Matt, Steve, Casey, Greatly appreciate your insights and uh, your time with us this morning. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks very much. Thank you. At this point, we'd uh, like to sign you guys off, and um, I'll be uh, introducing our, our next speaker um, from uh, our supporting sponsor, Alice Akers Arney. Matt, Steve, Casey, good day. Good day. Richard, welcome. Good morning. How are you this morning? Well, I'm doing pretty well. I've uh, been enjoying uh, today's session and especially appreciate Casey's uh, read on our quick recovery out of this. I hope that's certainly the case. You are uh, nodding in agreement to his assessment? Well, I don't know about agreement. Let's just say I'm hopeful that he's, that he's right. <laughs> well, I know you've got a few words for us uh, this morning as, as a presenting sponsor of this Business Confidence uh, index forum and I want to turn that over to you and uh, hear what you have to present for us. You good to go Richard? Well that sounds good. Uh, first of all I really appreciate being here this morning and and uh, what a what a ride it's been huh? when you think about 90 days ago and as I started preparing uh, for this morning and with all the material uh, that 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 we've already heard I I thought I'd really focus on on kind of where we've come from and and frankly maybe the difference in how some businesses have have built confidence and optimism while others haven't and so as I as we do that I thought I'd move actually backwards uh, to the beginning of the year and look at look at where we were right uh, in in February uh, just a short 90 days ago. Um, if you'll move the slide forward here, I'd appreciate it. Next one. There you go. Uh, think about where we were in, in, in February. We were part of the longest economic expansion in United States history. Uh, we were, we were riding a pretty good wave, although many of us were concerned about recession. Uh, we certainly were, were, <laughs> We're riding away forward. We also experienced a uh, high in the stock market, right? Uh, uh, on February 12th, uh, 29,500, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial hit that number. And, and, and again, uh, a pretty, pretty significant uh, economic boost for us there in, in February. Then we, then we added, if you'll, I'm sorry, if you'll move the slide forward for me, uh, one more. Thank you. Then uh, unemployment, you know, at its lowest in 50 years. And so uh, I guess the point is, is that, you know, at the beginning of the year, certainly the economic picture was a lot different uh, than what happened afterwards. In March, as you know, we moved into uh, certainly the beginning of a recession and a significant drop in retail sales. Uh, in fact, the largest drop in retail sales since 1992. Then 22 million people file for unemployment 
uh, during the first part of COVID. Uh, what, again, what a change in just a short period of time. And then a 22 trillion, or I'm sorry, a two trillion uh, stimulus bill passed uh, by Congress. Um, in April, we'd spiked up to a 14.7 unemployment rate, and the Dow uh, at, the, at the end of March falls to 18,500. So, so what a, a turn of events in, in frankly about 45 days time. And as Matt Morrow was saying, uh, certainly something that, that none of us have ever experienced, particularly uh, in economic cycles that all of us have, have been through previously. Uh, many, many industries were impacted significantly. Uh, tourism, sports, entertainment, retail, restaurants. And, and two things, uh, obviously the governmental shutdowns and, and consumer behavior changing as a result of COVID. Uh, governmental shutdowns certainly created economic uh, turmoil for all of us. Um, and then some of us, in business anyway, were able to access some governmental programs. The uh, Payroll Protection Act was, was certainly one of them. But, but many uh, were either unable to qualify or, or frankly were just not prepared to, to take advantage of those things. So as we, as we kind of look back at it, 45 days and look at all the economic conditions and how they change. Um, businesses, obviously all of us were forced to make adjustments, alternative plans, uh, some layoff and furloughs, particularly in those industries I talked about. And in some cases, and unfortunately we've seen it here locally, uh, some businesses had to close. Um, the, the one thing though is, is many businesses uh, were able to pivot and they were able to uh, enact new business models. Uh, uh, they were able to convert to different products. A great example of that is distilleries moving into to, uh, protective equipment and other things. And then all of us have had to deal with all of these post-COVID protocols, right? And all the various things that we've had to consider as a business uh, uh, moving forward. And I, it, it, it's really been interesting, uh, both, both owning a business and being part of that, and secondly, working with other businesses and, and determining, you know, how, why and how do some businesses effectively pivot and survive, in, in some cases even thrive, and others struggle and in some cases die? Now, now I do want to acknowledge certainly the industry that you're in has a significant impact on how you dealt with this. There are some industries uh, that have been devastated, tourism, travel, entertainment, sports, uh, et cetera. But but for the, the, the rest of us who may not have been so severely impacted, you know, one thing that we found in our own businesses, and I look at other businesses, and I'm also going to bring my city council experience into this and, and talk a little bit about the city here, is, is it seemed like businesses that, that prepared, uh, planned, executed that plan and then took action, continued to build confidence by doing that. Now, certainly all of us had our confidence shaken, right, as a result of what happened to us. However, just doing those things of planning and executing and taking action builds confidence over time, right? We see it in, we see it in sports teams. We see it in business, we see it all across our society. And so there were really three areas that, that I think stood out uh, as, as we moved through this crisis. 
uh, one, a solid team, which I'll talk about, two, technology and our increasing use and our proficiency in how we use it, and, and thirdly, obviously financial resources. So let's visit just a little bit about, about teamwork and building a team and how I think that that can build confidence for businesses. Uh, you know, average teams can do, you know, relatively well under good circumstances. But what I think we find across the board, whether it be a sports team or a business team, is in crisis or when you hit turbulence, good teams perform much, much better. I'm a, I'm a big Kansas City Chiefs fan, and, and obviously we had a great year last year, but I think back to that Texans game where uh, the, the Texans jumped out to a 24-point lead, and, and things looked bleak, but obviously Kansas City has a great team, and in, frankly, a matter of about 10 minutes, they came back and, and actually took the lead before halftime. So again, uh, that's a sports analogy, but business works the same way. Good and great teams perform better in crisis. Um, if, if you had a good team, you undoubtedly developed a plan, executed a plan, and obtained results. Um, here's the, the point I'd like to make. The confidence really, I think, grows into optimism. And we'll talk a little bit about that both here and in the next segment. But, but confident and optimistic companies then develop plans for the future and capitalize on opportunities. And I do think that although this is certainly a very, very difficult time, there are opportunities that are gonna be presented and I think good teams will take advantage of that. Technology probably <laughs> can't express enough. Uh, remote work has become a way of life. Uh, the use of virtual meetings, in fact, we're on one today. and and the limitations of travel, if you uh, are a business that does lots of traveling, I think uh, uh, virtual meetings are be gonna become a norm where people are gonna be traveling much less even after COVID, and certainly that has changed. And then it's been really amazing to me to see all the online activity, whether it be ordering and purchasing or paying online, uh, and certainly marketing. And so companies that were positioned from a technological standpoint or are positioning themselves are gonna be much better able to manage uh, what we're doing. Lastly, and probably can't express this enough, financial strength. Um, companies that had strong balance sheets, cash reserves, and access to capital really you know, we're able to weather this much, much better. And their access to capital and their relationship with financial advisors really, really are important. You know, I, we saw many companies with great banking relationships and very capable bankers uh, go to work, roll up their sleeves and, and really help area businesses. And we saw the opposite of that too, where where maybe a business didn't have a strong relationship and, and didn't have access to capital. As, as we look back to, again, teams, technology, and financial strength, I might just say that the city of Springfield, I happen to serve on city council, we have a really strong team over at the city. And I'll, I'll give a couple of our staff members big props here. Uh, Jason Gage, our, our city manager, again, a very experienced and capable person. Mary Lily Smith, who heads our planning department, who was really part of and continues to be part of how we're managing through this as it relates to businesses. And Clay Goddard, our health department director. Think about the strength of that team and how the city was able to manage that. Technology, again, uh, uh, I think all of us have learned a lot. and We're certainly learning at the city, but we were able to quickly pivot and hold our council meetings online. Um, 
really haven't figured out how to get the public as engaged as we like to yet, but we're working on that. So again, you know, we, I think we had generally pretty good technology. Here's where I really want to give our community and our city a lot of credit. And this goes back many years. We have built significant cash reserves. We have over a 20% reserve uh, that we've established, a double A bond rating, but more importantly, we built a self-insurance program with significant reserves. We're able to access that self-insurance program and act like we had a claim. Of, uh, and, and so because we control it, right? Loss of business income, by the way, isn't covered by a communicable disease or a pandemic like this, but we're able to say, hey, we run our own program. We're gonna say it's covered. And we're able to take that funding and use it. So the city is in excellent financial shape and able to, again, pivot and continue to take advantage of some opportunities that we have. So moving forward, you know, we heard several predictions about the economy just a second ago on the effects and impacts of COVID-19. And as I mentioned, I hope, and frankly, I buy into the fact that this is going to be a relatively short recession, I will say with some significant long-lasting impacts, but I believe that we will come out of it felt relatively quickly. It, it appears our economy is, is slowly recovering, and, and that's a good thing, and hopefully by the, the third and fourth quarter, we'll see more of that. But, but no doubt, uh, regardless of this recovery, many things uh, will change. I mentioned these three things, and I think that they're invaluable moving forward. You know, a solid team, the continued use of technology and building your, your financial strength. And I think there are keys in building confidence and more importantly, remaining optimistic because optimistic companies, optimistic communities are going to come out of this much stronger and be able to take advantage of opportunities that are available in the marketplace. So it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I, I certainly wish all area businesses out there the best, of, the best of luck. And obviously you make your own luck by your plans. But uh, again, thanks for the opportunity to be with you. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, I think that's a, a very valuable message for all of us. Uh, certainly business is not the same as it was uh, just a few short months ago. And uh, I, I love your message that if you didn't have your ship in order before, now is the perfect time uh, to adjust your sales. So thank you so much. Uh, we're actually going to have you stick around with us. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Titus Williams will be joining us here in a moment. Um, the reason we're asking you to join us is you mentioned that you are a member of city council. Uh, of course, you're a citizen, you're a business owner and a city council member. And uh, I don't know which of you will speak today. You can let us know. You're pretty good about telling us which hat you have on. Uh, and uh, you and Titus have a very unique view in this uh, perspective that you work with hundreds of businesses. Uh, Titus Williams, uh, head of Prosperity Properties, uh, a real estate development company uh, specializing primarily in commercial and multifamily properties. So he has insights into many businesses as well, but he also has the insight of his residents, many of whom are uh, frontline staff workers in some of the industries that you mentioned are hardest hit, such as tourism, retail, and, uh, excuse me, and uh, restaurants. So, um, I'm going to change my view so I can see all of you. Thank you for joining us, Titus. So good to see you this morning. Thank and you. and uh, we're going to start off uh, actually with Richard on this one. Uh, Richard, we're currently in a recession with estimates that will last anywhere from a few short months to 10 years. With such uncertain futures, why is the city continuing the course to move forward with projects like the Grant Avenue project. The, the question being, you know, we have immediate short-term needs, uh, but we have a lot of long-term 
uh, economic development needs? You know, great question. And I think it really relates to what we were just talking about is, is one, we have a good team over at the city. And I mentioned some of our strongest team members that are leading this effort. I think that's exceptionally important. Um, and, and, and we're coming at it with relative financial strength. So we have the ability to continue with our plans. And, and what I was concerned about, and I'm always concerned about as a business in a community, is we really had a kind of a choice, right? Are we going to crawl in a hole and, and, and batten down the hatches, or are we gonna move forward with existing projects and opportunities? And, and let me just give you an idea just real quickly about what we've got on the tote board and what we're actually doing uh, as we move forward. Uh, you, you mentioned the Grant Avenue project, a $26 million project. Um, again, we're going out for RFQ, and I'm assuming that as we move through that process and the design build process, we'll get started on that project. We just approved Idea Commons uh, in the downtown area, MSU leading the way on that, which will in turn allow us to daylight Jordan Valley Creek. And so that is a, an incredible project. The art museum expansion. Again, moving forward with that, we're doing stormwater improvements. Um, Costco, we just approved a finance or a incentive package for Costco, another big project. Craft, Craft is uh, buying a ton of equipment and going to employ uh, people in our community. City Utilities has a $120 million fiber project. They're in the middle of and underway. And don't forget about our school district and the $170 million bond issue and the projects to totally revamp our, our, our school district. So again, I am really, really pleased that the city, city utilities and the school district were in a position uh, because they had a good team because they had financial strength, right? That, that we are able to move forward with these projects. And I, I really think that in five years, we are gonna be light years ahead of, of, of where we would have been if we wouldn't have been in the position to continue that push forward. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Titus, uh, we know that city projections are that in the, the immediate future for fiscal year 2021, uh, their projecting tax revenues will drop by 20%. Uh, what that means to the business community is that uh, the revenues are decreasing as well. And uh, that means that some companies are experiencing a recession while others are, are in a, a full on re, uh, depression and some have already closed if we, as we've mentioned uh, and may, more may to come. In the short term, what programs could the city develop to help existing businesses get through this incredibly difficult financial time? Well, in the sh short term, um, there's actually some things that they've already been doing. For, uh, I was at a city council meeting a few uh, weeks ago, and they have um, proactively went and said that they would change um, the uh, ability for restaurants to have outdoor seating in parking lots, do things that are typically not thought of, and um, you know, serving, uh, uh, allowing restaurants to serve it in a different way, which allows for some of those struggling businesses to continue operations, which um, you know, uh, I think was very proactive and very thoughtful for the city to actually take that approach. Um, there's other things that the city is able to do uh, based on. Uh, funds received by the federal government. You know, there's, uh, I just received an email yesterday about a, um, a loan up to $10,000. And if you qualify, you can get a potentially forgivable loan from the, from the city. Um, so there's different things that the city has actually started the process of, of doing to improve um, the viability and the strength of, of local businesses which um, to uh, Mr. Aulis's uh, comment earlier, it's really, we're, we're lucky to live in a community that has such a 
strong leadership and uh, very experienced and knows how to navigate some pretty tricky areas that most uh, bureaucratic organizations aren't able to go through. And um, we're just, we're fortunate to have it. Uh, on a short-term basis, um, because of some of the things that we have experienced here uh, recently, um, it's unique in nature. So the ability for the city to be reactive uh, and be able to do some things fairly quickly is, is very beneficial. In my past, I worked for uh, the North Dakota Department of Commerce and the Development Fund. And what that uh, entity did, um, which we talked about last year in the growth survey, was a business development loan fund. It was a revolving loan fund that actually had a component to it that had the ability to have uh, an angel fund so that if a business was either a startup um, or was a business that had um, a little bit of a track record and they were experiencing something, um, you know, a, a hiccup in their operations because of you know, a pandemic or some other type of thing that was outside of their control, um, the, that loan fund would have the ability to then loan monies um, or invest into the business as a uh, angel investor. Those type of programs I think would be beneficial to implement in the future um, if we're able to do it. And if it's a revolving loan fund or an angel investor, the benefit is, is that if you start it, you know, even with uh, a small amount of resources, it potentially gets to a, a uh, size uh, within a few years that it will uh, not need to be uh, funded out of the general fund again. Um, of course, that is, uh, um, it has to have good leadership on that because of the, the analyses that takes to do a loan or an investment. But those are some things that I think would be beneficial for the city. Um, for clarification, Titus, um, are, are these programs, because uh, what I hear you saying is that these are internally managed funds by the city. Are these typically just funded by the city? You, you mentioned angel investors. Are there private investors? Is there room for nonprofits to get involved? How is that typically funded? It, it could be funded from a, a number of different ways. Um, and there's different, re, uh, different, uh, different avenues based on the type of fund that's created. Um, if it's a, uh, a loan fund that um, invests into a certain type of demographic or qualifying business, you would have, uh, banks would have the ability to have a uh, qualify for re uh, community reinvestment acts so they get the credit from a, from a banking standpoint. Springfield actually had a, an, uh, an angel investment fund a few years ago. Um, and um, it, so that was a private uh, investment fund that was put together that was actually outside of, of the city. But um, what, in the past, um, we have actually seen it that the, uh, what I worked on with the development fund was, um, it was a public organization that ha had the um, people that were either in the, either in the banking world or um, had an investment experience were on the board. So it, it can take a number of different directions. It can be public specifically for the public. It can do, you know, especially with banks or it can be funded from a, a private organization or the combination of all three. Fantastic. Thanks for that clarity, Titus. Uh, Richard, uh, as I recall, we, we talked about this topic a little bit in the growth survey last year. Uh, there was uh, some momentum with some individuals who thought this sounded like a great idea. So I'm curious, you know, the, the city, we want to note that the city has allocated $400,000 of the CARES Act fund for forgivable uh, business loans, as Titus mentioned, so up to $10,000 per company um, that can help them in the short term. Uh, but has the city ever discussed developing an internally managed business development grant or loan program? If so, what's, what's the barrier that's prevented the city from doing that? And if not, do you think the city would be open? You know, I, I, I might first mention that the city actually does have a, a, a program for long-term loans. Uh, it's, a, it's a program for small businesses uh, that, that can buy a low, that can access, I should say, low interest loans for up to 20 years. In order to qualify though, there are a couple of things that businesses need to do. Number one, it has to help low to moderate income people in our community. Or two, it has to uh, help with the elimination of blight. But, but again, 
there is a, a, a current a business loan, small business loan program that is in operation. We also have several things that, that we do for businesses. Uh, one, and Costco is a good example of this, we do offer incentive type programs in order, we, we require the developer to build all the public infrastructure around the business expansion. And, and so you can imagine as a business, there is no ROI, right, on, on building roads and stoplights out in front of your business. Well, well obviously they can, they can get some abatements and other things where uh, it can help them uh, recapture uh, some of that money associated with the infrastructure. And then we have another program that, that really focuses on the elimination of blight. And we've, we've designated several areas. One is downtown, one is Commercial Street, another is Galloway, and a fourth and new uh, zone is up in the Kearney Street area. And so there are incentives and the abatement of uh, property taxes for your improvements if you're willing to invest in those. So those are the existing things that we have. The one thing I will say that the city needs and has to do a better job of is removing barriers for business. We have a very uh, complicated and complex and cumbersome process to go through to get business uh, permits, uh, me, me, I should say building permits, and 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 frankly get through that process and we're working on that right now to improve that but but i think the number one thing that the city can do in my opinion is to make it easy and simple to do business in our community to do business to develop projects to we we need to have the attitude of customer service. Sure, we're in the regulation business, right? It's what, it's what you have to do with codes and other things. But we have to come at it with a very, very customer-friendly attitude and a problem-solving attitude. And, and again, I think we have work to do in that area. I, I don't really anticipate that we have huge plans to roll out these big business uh, uh, you, you know, loan programs in addition to what we're doing. But I do think that we have significant plans to use what we have as well as improve the process you need to go through if you're expanding or building a project or your business in the community. So is it, is it a fair summation to say that there are programs to help companies that are growing if you are not growing and expanding, uh, accessing capital through a, a traditional bank loan or something is, uh, I hesitate to say only option, but is, is, that, is that a fair summation, at you least know, from I the think, city perspective? I, I think that's true. There are other governmental programs and certainly we're going to look at, we're always going to look at uh, alternatives and options on how we may be able to partner uh, with other organizations, whether they be the federal government, like we did with the BUILD grant, uh, or, or other alternatives. And so, so I think we're wide open, and Titus mentioned a couple of short-term things we did, right, with restaurants and, and opening up that. Um, so we are absolutely open to looking at alternatives. But I, I get back to, again, and, and this is just my opinion, the 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 best thing we can do is to make it easy, simple, and effective to do business in our community. And that's an area, candidly, we need to improve upon. Uh, Titus, is there anything that you'd like to say to close us out? Yeah, I, th I agree with uh, Mr. Aulis there. I, it's not the responsibility of the city, in my opinion, to have to burden the, the whole uh, opportunity for businesses to to grow and to succeed. If we have the ability as uh, community leaders, um, there's multiple different opportunities for us to put together, you know, uh, you know, the angel funds or uh, other types of short-term business development 
uh, loan funds outside of the uh, of the city's involvement, and I believe that's probably more beneficial. That way, um, you don't also have the bureaucracy that's that's usually associated with a city. Sure. Uh, well, seems like uh, we've discussed it in in part for two uh, great surveys. Let's hope that next year we can have an update on that angel fund. How about that, Titus? Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you both very much for joining us. Very interesting conversation and perspectives. We appreciate you both very much. Uh, we are now, um, there's been a lot of discussion this morning on uh, the pandemic and the economic issues that we have experienced uh, worldwide but specifically the issues that we're experiencing locally. Uh, but there was also uh, a lot of civil unrest that occurred in the middle of, of the pandemic that prompted uh, protests across the country, uh, some to differing degrees. Fortunately in Springfield, we had uh, largely uh, peaceful protests and demonstrations, but there were recommendations for uh, businesses to close during uh, these protests in uh, an abundance of caution. And so our next segment, uh, which is going to be led by Eric Olson, uh, our editorial director, is going to be talking to two business owners and their perspective of why they stayed open during the downtown uh, protests. So we're going to uh, welcome uh, Michelle Bolonis and Dave Bauer, uh, both with Downtown Businesses, and I'm going to switch out the mic, the mic with Eric Olson. Thank you so much. Morning, Michelle. Good morning. How are you? Great. Good to see you. We're still Hi, here. Eric. <laughs> Hi, Dave. Hi, Michelle. Hi there. To... Hello, Eric. It's good to be back uh, rejoining you guys in this forum discussion. I hope you have uh, found it fruitful uh, for your own businesses. Yeah. Uh, good, good. For sure. Uh, as Mary Ellen uh, uh, so well uh, set the stage, I want to continue that and uh, really get to shift this conversation to a cultural matter um, from the kind of the nuts and bolts of the economy and um, the, the data that we've been discussing all morning long. So here, here's the stage. Both of you uh, own businesses in, in downtown Springfield, right off of the square. Uh, Michelle with the coffee ethic um, on the square. Dave, uh, about a half a block off with Harbell's um, sports grill and, and bar. And um, on June 6th, some 2,500 people descended in your front yards. Um, the, I understand that the recommendation from the city, from the police department on that day was to shut down, close your business during the, uh, the demonstration for Black Lives Matter. That left you each with a decision to make. So I want to I get into that, the, the, the strategy and, and your thought processes and what happened um, that day and, and since. So if... Uh, if you, we could begin, um, you guys are already in the middle of this um, medical pandemic and the economic slowdown that we all have all endured, and then this racial pandemic comes to your front door. What were your first thoughts in, in hearing uh, what your, the decision in front of you, the options that you had? What were your first thoughts? Michelle, go ahead. Uh, well, my first thought was, um, you know, why are we being, why is it suggested, you know, that we shut our doors during this time? That was my initial thought. And I looked into that right away because um, I had never been, I had never heard it suggested that we shut our doors during a protest and, and we had never shut our doors during a protest. So that caught me off guard a little bit. And so I did a little bit of, you know, research and talking to some people and trying to figure out, well, is there something I don't know that I should know? Was there maybe a threat made or was there reason for, um, you know, I don't know, danger. And so that was my first concern. And so once I found out that, you know, it was merely a suggestion and that it wasn't something we had to do, I, I really, pretty much knew at that moment that we would stay open because we have never shut our doors for any other protest. So that was my first thought on, on that. And it really, from that point on, we really didn't look back. 
you know, it was like, well, we're going to be open. So. Dave, how about you to open or not to open on that day? Well, um, well, firstly, on the previous speakers, I took advantage of, and I took advantage, but all the parts that they talked about, economic impact, uh, the city loans, the economic development, I was lucky enough to be able to be a part of each of those processes. So I just want to mention that. When it came to uh, receiving the letter, actually, my staff contacted me first and said, oh, by the way, they're suggesting that we close. Um, on Saturday because of um, the, um, the protest rally. Now, I consider more of a rally than a protest myself, but, um, and they all wanted, the first thoughts to them was, we, to them, what we were going to close down. And that was actually my last thought was, we're going to close down. We're, we're going to stay open. And I went through the whole spectrum of, do I hire law enforcement to be in front of my building? What should I do? And I just, the type of person I am, I guess, I think it's fine for people to get out and profess what they want to, and they should be able to do that. And yes, there's going to be some people that are going their 10 minutes of fame and something might happen. And they were request us to pull our patio furniture inside. And I just told my staff, we are not doing that. We are going to take this head on and we're going to support people to have the right to, to rally and protest and announce their, um, uh, the fact that they're unhappy with the way things are going on and we know it's going to be 95 degrees or 90 degrees and we're going to help these people stay hydrated. That was our first thought. It wasn't about, oh, we're going to miss business. Oh, we're not going to get the dollars from having all the people downtown. It was, we are not going to just close our doors because we're worried about or board our windows up because they're having a rally. Yes, there could have been some issues, but I wasn't concerned about it. I, I felt that uh, Springfield's a great city, and I think that um, we were going to do it properly, and they did. To be fair, I, I think some of the uh, suggestion on closing was to permit employees of those businesses to attend the rally as well. Is that your understanding from the uh, that communication? I didn't get that from that, actually. No. I, yeah, I wasn't, that wasn't part of my understanding of that community, you know, the reasoning behind that communication, but you know, I, I have no idea really. It seemed like more of a safety issue for. That's what it seemed like to me, but I was basing that on my previous history of not ever being asked to close, close down during a protest. So. Mm -hmm. Both of you remained open. And it, to uh, some level, supported those who were out there. Um, Dave mentioned the, the hot temperatures that day. Uh, what was your the reception from um, from the the crowd there? Your, and what was your interaction with them uh, during that a couple hours of, of protest? Well, for my my staff, uh, we had people coming back in and thanking us for the water. That was pretty much, uh, they were all positive with the fact that we were just, we support everyone. You know, we just, you should have the right to be able to speak your mind and, and be able to rally and protest and do it lawfully. And that's what we, that's what we wanted. And um, we had a number of people stop by on their way out and thank us for the fact that we just gave them water without charging them. We just wanted to make sure they were safe we had almost an identical response. Um, everybody came in and, and was very happy we were open. They thanked us for, um, you know, the water. We also had water out there um, and they were just, it was super peaceful. Everybody was happy, um, you know, and um, civil. So, I mean, it was a really great experience and we got a lot of thank yous for staying open. Thank you for letting us use the restroom. Thank you for the water. So that was, it was great. These are decisions that can be divisive because the issue at, at hand is one of, of such, it has connections to uh, political positions. And um, from the standpoint of a business, I wonder what sort of, um, strategy was in place for you guys to face whatever comes um, and it, have you received any blowback we just did a, a live live polling of our audience and if we could throw that screen back up i want to see the results again of 
of the question um, whether uh, a, a business position on a cultural issue affects a purchase decision. And uh, here this morning, we see that um, the majority say no, it, it does not. Um, was that a factor for you deciding what you did? Do you, do you think that dollars were at risk uh, for your you remaining open that day? It wasn't a factor as far as uh, is it going to hurt our business. What what I, I knew, we had some fallout. We had some people comment on the internet, and that always happens. And but I, I actually stood back and let the other people on the internet kind of basically voice their opinion about it. You know, being in the restaurant business, I can't be Democratic, I can't be Republican, I can't be pro, I can't be against, because that throws your business into it. So I have to stay neutral with everything that I do. I, I look at everything just a, with an open mind. And um, it's difficult at times because there's things that I do want to say. But for my business, if I were to profess my direction, my business would certainly take a hit. And I'm about the restaurant business and what we do with my staff. And I have, you know, 40 employees and, that I need to take care of and they need to make sure they make their funds. I don't need to to throw my opinion in at any time to kind of draw back away from that myself. But for this decision in particular, have you found that it kind of puts you in that uh, position? Because of, and I'm thinking too of other businesses that are um, working through the, the dilemma here in, in real time. And you know, I've talked with some that there is, it's a struggle to know what to say and what not to say. You might have good intentions and it comes out wrong and then you get the blowback on that side when you meant, meant for good. Um, this is, you know, from uh, a business standpoint of for you guys are just simply remaining open, but that does have connections to what are those implications. So how did uh, it, how did that affect you guys? Have, have you seen any, heard any uh, feedback um, Negative to, negatively as a result. Um, Dave spoke that he he had some comments on on Facebook. Um, we really haven't had any negative feedback. It's been pretty positive, positive. Um, and I agree with Dave on like you feel like you can't say anything because um, you risk losing customers and whatnot. Um, and I, I try to stay away and we try to tell our staff not to be talking about, you know, religion and politics, you know, behind the bar or, uh, and whatnot. Um, and so, I mean, it is a thing. We want everyone to feel welcome, everyone. Um, and so, but the goal and the reason why this was a little bit different for me was because it just seemed like it was, it was different. It was bigger than I had ever seen in a long time. And it was so the atrocities that were happening were just, it was something I could not ignore as well. And I just um, kind of had to look back at my core values as a business. And I have a little bit more, I think, um, I don't know, because we're independent, we have some flexibility in that. We get to choose what we do um, and what we say and how we respond to things that are going on in the world. And so, um, it, I had to contemplate this for a while and, and, and saying, what, what do I do? You know, do I put a statement out there because I don't want to put a statement out there just because I don't want to seem, you know, racist or something, you know, I want to do it because it's truly comes from my heart. And, um, I was reassured when I went back to our core values and, and, you know, a big part of our core values, well, they're cup people in earth, but the people part is really about community and, you know, we, in our statement, we talk about providing a safe and enriching space for people. And I want, I just wanted whoever, you know, I just wanted the black people in our community to know that we stood with them. Um, and I, and I, I did choose my words wisely because I didn't want to, I just wanted them to know that we support them. And um, how could I go wrong by doing that? And I do support them and I do love them. And I do want to grow and seeing some transformation within our community. And if I lose customers for that, then that's okay with me. So um, that's kind of what I ended up, I ended up deciding that this was more important than losing some customers. Um, and I had a chance to make 
a positive impact as a business, you know, and, and so anyway, we, I just decided to go for it and, and it was just too important. I couldn't, could not ignore it. Have either of you put out statements on behalf of your businesses since then, or do you plan to? I, we, I don't. We I, did. Go ahead. We yeah, did. I, I, I don't, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's you. <laughs> well, uh, it, and she's right. It does get to the core values because with me being my age and, and living through the Vietnam War and seeing what all happened within those days, and it was more than just, it, it seemed that it was the black community and it was the communities of, of less economic means that went to the front lines. And it's always been, it's, it's more than just a black, white um, uh, people of color issue. It's also an economic factor as well with some of these issues we have going on right now. And um, it, there has been problems for years and years and years, as long as I've been alive and before that. And I think that this was with the social media advance these days, there's people feel more empowered a little bit to kind of feel the way they want to feel about what's going on. Um, I am a, I, I back the police force. I, I, I back uh, being lawful. I back businesses. I back trying to bring the next guy up. That's just what I want to do. I'll, I'll take someone that maybe is, has a little less than me because I always worry about how bad my life is and I look at how other people's lives are and I think that I have, my life's not so bad. So I've always, the whole time I've been in business, it's been try and raise females up to higher positions, try and raise minorities up to a higher position. It's just, I think that only makes our community stronger and I think that's why Springfield is such a great place because it's kind of a melting pot a little bit of the larger cities around plus the the original Springfield mentality. And I think it's growing and growing with a very diverse community. And I think that hopefully that a lot of other communities can take on what we did our, in Springfield and how the government handled it, how the city handled it, how the police department handled it and how the people in the city handled it. And I think that um, we just need to allow people to discuss and to show their concern. So for you, Dave, not a not a statement issued, but more of a this is our culture as a as an organization. That's, that's correct. Okay, Michelle. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I want to learn more about and educate our staff on, and and so I think, you know, one important thing that we have to remember is that, um, you know, just be, you know, there that to not let it pass without, um, you know, checking in and periodically throughout the year and talking about, well, what, what is our cultural consciousness right now? What, and what are we learning about races and, and how are we going to implement that within our, our shop, you know, and, and what does that look like and giving our staff tools to be able to interrupt racism if they see it or to be able to, um, know, you know, what not to say, or, you know, and basically, just teaching ourselves throughout the year and the years to follow and not just letting this pass without really acting on it. Um, and a huge part for, of that for us is, is, has been training and, and starting some trainings on that. Um, and so I'm excited about that and I'm excited to actually incorporate a statement within our, you know, business plan and our um, core values that is kind of touches is more specific so it's hard it's hard you just you know someday i will be able to express the way i really feel about life i i just being a business operator you've got to walk the fine line you have to be you have to go both directions left right up down you have you have to be, be right in the middle or you cost your employees you and cost your business heartaches that you don't need and that's Something about being, when you're in the business, you have to be the business first and your personality second. But someday, someday I'll be able to really get out and say what I feel. But right now, I just have to do business as usual, you know, and tell the line, which sometimes pretty sad for a business operator. I sense a little bit of frustration for you in that, Dave. There is a little bit, but you have to do it. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the thing to do. And... Um, it's just the way life is. You just have to business first, 
and uh, to a point, business first. One last thought before we move on to our last segment for this morning's forum, and that's the where do we go from here? As, as Michelle, you mentioned, this was a, um, a massive event that's been building and so much so that it's, it's changed you, how you operate um, internally and, and what you're, how, what you're um, talking with staff about and, and training them. What are some steps that other businesses can consider to get involved in the conversation to influence uh, their staff on how to approach uh, the topic of race in our city, in our, in our offices? Um, are there some steps that you're aware of or already taken that, that you can recommend or, or what, what's lacking? What do we need? Well, I mean, in Springfield, our, our population doesn't allow for a lot of, I mean, we do have some diversity, but we really don't when you compare it to some of the bigger cities. And so that makes it difficult. But one of the things that um, I have always wanted is I want to see people in our shop of, from all different places. I think that just only makes the community better. And, and, and that's what I want to start seeing. And um, part of that is trying to um, advertise for positions in a broader way, um, instead of like talking to a friend or having a, a, one of my employees say, hey, do you know anybody who needs a job? You know, maybe post it out there in, you know, in social media so that you get more of a diverse um, applications and people. And so that's one thing. And then the other thing, you know, as I mentioned, is I, I actually hired three women who um, train, who actually have experience in um, culture uh, consciousness um, uh, and racial issues, and they, they can come in and they can, they can have a whole training session. We just did one on Monday, and if anybody wants to know more about that, I can get them that information because it was phenomenal. And we have a whole list of resources um, from books to documentaries to um, podcasts um, that can help us all educate ourselves and, and um, basically pick through all the layers that, that is racial um, inequality. Um, and I have learned more in the last two months about this than, than I have my entire life. And um, which is kind of shocking and it makes me question why why haven't I learned, you know, um, you know, so anyway, those are the steps that I'm taking and that I would recommend. Uh, and I don't know what Dave has, but what, what's the name of that organization, if you don't mind. You well, um, there's just three women. They, they kind of are new. Um, they've been doing it, I think for a year, maybe, maybe two, um, in other, you know, through a different, whole different, Avenue, but I happen to know one of the, the ladies and she said that she could customize it for small business and they're actually hoping to do more of that. So they don't have a name right now, but um, our workshop was called cultural consciousness and anti-racism workshop. Uh, so it, I'll get that information to you and maybe we can post later about it. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Good for you. Well, um, this has been an enlightening conversation and thank you for sharing your stories both of, of how you adapted and, and um, what you've gone through um, when, when this was presented to you and uh, Michelle at the Coffee Ethic, Dave at Harbell's, both downtown businesses, um, plugging away at it. I know this is, these are hard times even uh, with the, uh, the economy as it is, but um, you guys are, are uh, still there and fighting the fight. So. Thanks for joining us this morning and sharing your stories. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. We will uh, move to our, our next forum segment and that's a, a town hall discussion. So um, saying goodbye to Michelle and Dave and I'd like to uh, welcome Christine Temple. She is our features editor and audience development director for Springfield Business Journal. Christine, welcome, how are you? Good morning. Doing well today? Doing well, how are you? Good, good. Enjoying this conversation. And um, now, though, I'm ready to hear from our audience. They've been taking it all in and, uh, and, and silence, and we want some active participation. And so, um, 
Christine, I'm glad you're joining me to, to lead this town hall and, and get those uh, thoughts going. As our, our uh, final segment, we want to um, go back to a slide that we saw earlier in the program. And um, this was something that was, was uh, drawn out from the first webinar we did at the end of May when we had our, our, our two rounds of surveys uh, completed and we presented those results. Uh, we did a live poll of that audience and um, that's where the word safety came up in these discussions. We were asking what is the, the key word or factor when you think of uh, facilitating an economic recovery. Um, you can see the, the answers here in this word cloud. Safety uh, pops off, but there's also some, some very good and worthwhile uh, words of respect, of cooperation. Um, but safety was one that even trumped um, stimulus funding or remote working, um, hiring. So I found, that, I found that very interesting that in order for us to recover economically, we need to establish safety in our community and in our businesses before um, anything else. And so this, this conversation is gonna focus on that connection of having business confidence um, tied to how we feel in terms of our being safe at home and at work. And so um, really the, this, the question to begin at all, I think is how do we get back there? How do we get back to feeling safe to spend and safe to work full throttle again? Um, I don't know. I, I, and I wonder if those are, are even opposing thoughts. They seem like uh, they could be, but at least which, which comes first, uh, feeling safe to, to go on with life as it was or um, getting in the routine of work again. And how, what's the, you, what do you think, Christine? Have, have you felt safe to get back at it? Yeah, and I'd love to hear what our attendees feel on this too. But um, I think that what we're experiencing right now is this huge cultural opportunity for businesses to show what they're about within their business. Because what makes me feel safe is when a business is proactive about going above and beyond what they're required to do to make me um, safe within their business, interacting with their employees, interacting with other customers. Um, one thing, you know, that I said really early on in this pandemic and committed to in print, which kind of, um, you know, has been a challenge for me because now I committed to wearing a face mask in public. And so I better not ever go out in public without a face mask. But um, I thought that was really important to say that. And so when I've been to businesses where employees are not wearing face masks, where other customers aren't, where businesses are not asking that question, that is a challenge for me to feel safe. Um, because we know, uh, we saw within the Great Clips example, um, you know, two uh, hairstylists worked for a week and interacted with 140 clients. And of those that were tested, none tested positive because both sides were wearing a face mask. So I think it's a real test for businesses right now to show their ability to really stand up and put safety as the number one priority. And I think that that will probably um, play out really well for them in the long run. Let's, uh, let's ask our audience what they think as, as you... Uh... Well, it looks like maybe Eric left for a second, but... Um, as far as uh, questions for our audience, it seems like, which do you feel safer doing? Um, it looks like most of you are saying going out and spending in the local economy. Um, and just a quarter of you are saying going back to work full time um, at this point. You know, that's, uh, you know, Springfield Business Journal isn't back in the office and full force just yet. Um, if anyone wants to talk on, you know, how they are uh, dealing with that in their business? How are you guys putting safety procedures in place to make employees feel comfortable? And how are you dealing with employees that have differing opinions on that? 
Yeah, and if you have some words that uh, uh, answer Christine's question, just give a wave and our uh, technical staff will uh, bring you into the uh, discussion room. Well, it looks like Jackie uh, Barger from uh, Children's Smile Center is saying his sense of the word safety is in relation to the public health related to the pandemic. So um, I don't know, Jackie, if you're if you're kind of sharing with us that you're needing a vaccine maybe <laughs> before you'll feel safe. I think that that's what we've heard from some folks as well. Um, we heard from Matt Morrow even earlier that, um, you know, we're not opening back up the economy because COVID is now a safer um, disease. It's just that we flattened the curve. We built enough time to have an ICU bed ready for you if you get sick. So, mm -hmm. and here's Jackie with us. Well, in our business, uh, first, can you hear me? Can hear you, Jackie. Yes. Well, good, good to see your face as well. Good morning. In our business, there are two words that we used in terms of how employees uh, felt about coming to work, and that was, uh, those were the words respect and support. We were anticipating that there could be a wide range of responses from our employees in terms of their comfort level in coming back to work. And uh, we made the decision that we were going to make uh, as much as possible different forms of personal protective equipment. And I'll say we, we are a healthcare office. Uh, so uh, in our work, we, we made uh, what we feel like an over-the-top response uh, with different forms of PPE available. But we did not mandate those. We did not uh, want to be big brother to the staff saying, you have to do A, B, C, X, Y, Z. But rather, uh, we would respect and support their position. Uh, I will say there has been moderate to minimal utilization of the available PPE. And then after the fact, we felt good that we didn't mandate that. We let each employee uh, make their own decision about uh, what uh, measures they wanted to take. Now, we've also had a few comments from staff that were very concerned about the, the health implications of the pandemic. And uh, we've had a, a few people who were able to that have worked from home a little more uh, utilizing technology. So uh, I can see so many things in Mr. Aulis's presentation uh, that uh, were part of our reaction to help our employees come back to work and feel safe. As you're talking, Jackie, we have a, another poll, live polling question of what, what do you feel safe to do right now? And it, it um, to me, I see distancing. It relates everything here, um, outdoor, um, virtual meetings, telecommuting, home. There is work is pretty significant. I think that's worth acknowledging here. Um, Jackie and others who um, we'd, we'd invite to answer and chime in, as you've brought staff members back to the office for work, what best practices can you share? What safety measures that are you doing now that you weren't before so that they do feel respected um, and, and those things that are important to them? I'll start. We, uh, we implemented uh, temperature screenings for everyone who came to the front door of our office. That includes staff. We have our staff check in with a, a little check-in sheet with a couple of questions and a temperature check. And then as well, we do that for everybody else who comes to the building. Inside the, the office building, we've increased the number of disinfecting and sanitizing operations that we'll do during the course of the day. Uh, in terms of our healthcare interactions with patients, uh, we've been much more mindful uh, of, um, of the air in terms of things in the air and keeping people safe. But disinfecting and sanitizing is a normal operation for a healthcare facility. Uh, early in March, uh, I used to uh, have the trick question, what does a successful dental practice do as a result of, uh, of a potential uh, virus, a new virus or a uh, uh, airborne uh, illness. And the correct answer to that is a, a successful uh, healthcare practice does nothing because they're already doing it. And uh, so we, we make sure we communicate 
with our patients and families and staff that we're very successful in keeping a very uh, disinfected and sanitized office. We already were, but now we communicate that more now. Very good. Thanks for sharing that, Jackie. I'd invite others to, uh, to chime in, uh, give a wave so we know that we can uh, pull you into the uh, discussion room. What are, what are those best practices that, that you're instituting or would like to as staff returns to the offices? Anybody else? Well, and what I hear Jackie saying too is that he already was kind of implementing those procedures because of being a healthcare organization. So I'm thinking about those businesses that um, maybe didn't have to have cleaning as the top priority for the business. There's maybe some dust that builds up on the desk. Um, you clean once a week. That's totally shifted now. So for those folks that did not have to have those um, safety precautions in place before, what is this? What does this look like now? For your business too um, and also you know there's differing opinions with staff members juggling um, one person's very particular needs maybe they even have a, a health condition that's causing them to um, have to be even more cautious yeah that's right christine i see uh megan hi megan short welcome uh what are some of the best practices that you you're implementing or have seen we, since we have people coming from all different businesses, I mean, we've obviously had to really look at not just what an individual feels safe with doing, but also what does their company allow them to do. So we're really having to dig in on every single committee that we have. Um, in the beginning, we really start when we first started opening back up. It was by appointment only, you know, signs on the door, hand sanitizer, check in, all of that kind of stuff. But we've been just it's like a basically this constant surveying of how are you guys feeling? Um, small committees, do you want to start meeting in person if we have them move them to bigger rooms? Um, you know, we had we had a golf tournament and it was a lot of changes of like, okay, stay with you. You know, you've got your carts. We changed how we did lunch, box lunches, so people could grab their food and leave. They didn't have to go up into a crowded area. Um, offering, you know, additional carts and to keep people away if they need, uh, like individual. So we're trying to find a way to still have some of these things because we kind of have to do some of our stuff in person. And um, it's just this balance that we're constantly doing of who feels safe doing what, um, and then trying to do hybrids and really relooking at what all we're able to do from that standpoint too. Were the turnouts for those as crowds I see here is, is the number one thing that people are not feeling safe to be around. Um, you know, a golf tournament can create a crowd. Was, was yeah. the turnout okay? I mean, how did people respond? I mean, we actually had about the same turnout that we normally would. We just implemented changes to try to like, you know, one person would come up and check in rather than every single person. Hey, here's the stuff for your team. Um, tell us whenever everyone's here so we make sure. Um, you know, and like I said, we made changes for the lunch part. Uh, so we tried to spread everything out more. Um, because they were outdoor, I think a lot of people felt a little bit better. We even had one general membership meeting, which was an indoor one, and we knew attendance was going to be down. And we still had a, a larger group than I kind of thought we would, but it was the same thing. We just had tables set up very spread out, um, fewer people per. Um, obviously that one, you know, they were serving the food. So it, I think construction's a little different because they never shut down as an essential business. So to them, you know, we've been making all of these changes. We've been focusing on all of this stuff that they understand that they can't, most of the people in the industry cannot do anything to put their team at risk. So we're kind of all looking at it as, you know, it's not just what you're doing whenever you're here but it's if one person gets impacted, then that entire job site gets impacted, then that entire business you're working for gets impacted, then multiple other job sites. So um, for us, I mean, we're grateful because people understand that what you do impacts this massive ripple effect. And I think it, it's been nice to, even whenever we are together, that they just take extra precautions there too. As you were talking, uh, we, we've moved to the next question, but could we go back to that other slide real quick, just to see again, what people are not feeling safe doing. Um, crowds, 
events, office, those are um, pretty general things, but shopping is just like jumping out right there. I thought restaurants would be higher. People, I guess, are feeling comfortable enough to go to go back out in public and eat. Um, Christine, does anything surprise you here? What do you think? Well, I, I wonder about the restaurant because um, the way that we are experiencing restaurants now is so different. We can have it delivered to our door. It's just the norm. I would not had food delivered, you know, via an Uber Eats before this experience. Um, to go is kind of the norm. So maybe that's just a... Uh, feeling more comfortable because the services have shifted. Um, uh, unmasked gatherings. I think for sure that's a, that's a real interesting question. You know, Fayetteville um, just is now requiring masks in all public places based on a spike. Um, and, you know, I know city council just discussed this yesterday. Um, should we consider doing that, you know, in our, in our local community? I wonder uh, Megan, for you, you know, you, you have a, a big event every November um, that, you know, I, I full disclosure helped plan that event. But, you know, what are you thinking as far as masks go um, for a salute to construction or for a huge crowd getting together? Would that be something you would want to require? And how do you make that decision since the city is not uh, requiring that in most settings? I thankfully don't have to make that decision on my own because we have such a fantastic council of people that get to weigh in on that. Um, I think if it comes to the point that we need to require, that we are requiring masks on some of it, I, I personally think if that is still such a big fear, we need to move to online for this. Um, that specific event, um, like I said, with like when you pull in all of these business leaders, they're, you know, we want to make sure everybody is safe anytime. But when you're you're doing lifetime achievement awards, and a lot most of those people are gonna be a little bit older, well, a lot older, because it's the lifetime award. Um, when you talk about some of these other things, it's just if we're not if we don't feel comfortable coming in and finding a way to do this because there's a dinner and stuff like that. You can't wear a mask and eat your dinner. So if we're not prepared to be able to do that, I think we're going to have to have it online. I mean, we'll just find a way to adjust. We'll find a way to make everybody safe. Yeah, thank you, Megan. Thank you, Jackie. I want to invite others to, uh, to wave and join in on the conversation. At, uh, kind of springboarding from that comment to is there enough clear guidance out there? Christine and I were talking about this beforehand. Has, has a city, as a county, or, or health officials done enough, in your opinion, to, to give you those directives that you need to uh, feel secure in taking steps forward? Because there is some level of um, you know, being aggressive here. Now, it could be perceived as overly aggressive if you fully open your doors and don't require masks for staff and customers both. Um, do you feel that we, you have enough guidance from the uh, government officials as business owners to know how to handle this? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Eric. I'd love to hear from folks on that. Um, you know, I know Clay Goddard has said that his, his opinion on masks has changed throughout this pandemic as just kind of one example, um, but it's really gotten, um, it's gotten into a kind of a political conversation. And he said that there's a lot of danger when politics and public health kind of intermingle um, because it's not, the COVID is not a political virus. It's uh, irrespective of <laughs> anything, any demographic. And so um, there is that question too of like balancing um, regulation, you know, personal liberties. That's a big thing that I've heard from individuals, you know, just on my Facebook, it, you don't want to be told to, to wear something or to have to do something. You want it to be your own decision. Um, but how do you balance that with um, a potential spike? We're having our largest single days of cases in the state of Missouri in recent days. We haven't seen as big of a spike as Fayetteville, but um, it's still the largest numbers we've seen. It is um, actually creeping in from Northwest Arkansas, talking with health department officials um, into the, the Joplin corridor in McDonald County. So um, definitely something to be, to be mindful and watchful of. We are seeing in the, the poll responses here that 
uh, the view is that the county and the city are handling the uh, reopenings um, well. Uh, eight is the, the vast majority, it looks like. And um, I think from a communication standpoint, I would, I would agree with that 100% of staying on top of the, the movement of the virus. And, but it may be, uh, maybe there's some more directives that, that can be issued to help um, take the pressure off of a business owner uh, to make that decision on their own and say, well, this is, this is something that's coming from uh, health officials from the government and um, we want to do what's, what's most safe and, and secure for our community. Um, I, don't, I don't think we have any other, are there any other audience members who, uh, who would like to, to chime in? We're, uh, we're closing out on, on our time here this morning. I want to give you one last opportunity. All right, it doesn't look so. Uh, I appreciate the uh, participation of uh, Megan and Jackie and, and uh, all of you who have joined us here on, on the Zoom meeting. Christine, uh, good to see you. Um, we're, we're working we're, together, but we're, we're distancing. We're apart and it's uh, still getting much done. Thank you for your, for your uh, work and your time here with us this morning. Thank you so much, it was a great forum. All right, well, we're gonna um, transition and uh, wrap it up. I'm gonna uh, pass the, uh, the mic over to Jennifer Jackson, the publisher of the Business Journal. Thank you, Eric and Christine. As we wrap up today, I also wanna thank everyone uh, who tuned in today and our panelists for sure. Um, as with any virtual broadcast, it's never flawless. Um, but I appreciate your patience through this. Uh, luckily, you can't be in the room and see how the sausage is made. We had some difficulties maybe you weren't even aware of. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a discussion that will continue throughout the remainder of this year. Um, our next forum is scheduled for July 15th. I think it remains to be seen and announced exactly how that forum will take place. It is my sincere hope that before it is all said and done this year that we'll meet in person for some of these forums. Uh, I don't know if that will be the July 15th forum for sure. Um, again, I want to thank our uh, partners in this process. Uh, Titus Williams for your leadership in convening the steering committee who helped guide this research to begin with, but also our, all of our supporting sponsors, H Design Group, Brian Properties, Alla Sakers and Arney, and Toth and Associates. I also want to direct you to the print edition of the Springfield Business Journal. In the very next edition, you'll see many more uh, opinions expressed there and supplemental information in a special publication. And each of those will follow forums for the remainder of the year. Again, it's Springfield Business Journal's intention to make this data, these discussions readily available to you. So look to see uh, recordings of this event and pieces of it republished um, and we will continue to guide you um, to, to access this information for the purpose of individual business recovery. I think that what we're seeing through this and what we didn't actually need data to tell us is that our businesses are interconnected. Um, but what the data is able to guide us in is exactly what those needs and barriers are. And that's what uh, economic growth survey discussions are really about. So thank you for being here and we will see you next time. <laughs>